Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Buntrigger has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Buntrigger. Welcome, welcome, welcome back for another edition of Rock the Stage Show. It's Sunday night, it's 7 o'clock, and we are set to go for another exciting conversation. And as Sandra D, the wonderful Sandra D, who does the introduction, says, we talk with people all over the world. We cover a lot of different categories. But I can tell you tonight, we've never covered this category. And many of us might not even know this exists. I had never heard the term. Now, the concept I've heard of, but I do not know the details or the inside information. So join me tonight on an exploration of something new together, and we're going to have a great time doing it with our guest here this evening. So let me ask you as we get rolling, have you ever wrestled with how people are sometimes labeled or how they're perceived? It seems like we often slap a label on the people, their behaviors, and you know what? We often don't even like ourselves, but we do it. We put these labels on people. Sometimes they make us feel uncomfortable. Sometimes we just don't understand why they are the way they are and why they behave the way they do, but we have to come up with a label, uh, something to help us feel better about ourselves, or sometimes you dismiss them. Thankfully, times are changing, and tonight we're going to hear from an expert and a leader who is trying to help change some of this and move things into a better way of thinking, living, and engaging together in a, what's been a very difficult area. Kushpo Chabra is my guest tonight, and she's deeply passionate about the DEIB. We're going to get into that. She is a neurodiversity specialist and a transformational leader on a mission to advocate for and help provide access to high-quality services to inspire and improve the intentional inclusion of neurodistinct individuals in society. If you don't know what that means, you will in a few minutes. She also aims to make a meaningful impact on the world through education, empowerment, authentic engagement, and unbridled compassion. And believe me, when she comes on, you're going to feel it right there in your bones with you. So welcome, Kushbo, to Rock the Stage Show here tonight. Hi. Thanks for having me, Rich. It's so nice to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for jumping on here and being a part of the show. And by the way, we're in Washington, D.C. You're in sunny California. We're going mm-hmm. coast to coast tonight, but we're keeping it in the continental United States because you Absolutely. never know where we're going to go with this show. You know, this is a sticky topic for some people as we get into this. We just need to admit that this is not a comfortable space, but you're trying to make it more comfortable. And neurodiversity. From my research, it began back in the 1980s, 1990s, and as a way to invite, to kind of fight the stigma of those who have what would may, many would say are impairments, like ADHD, autism, learning disorders. So you're the expert here. What really is neurodiversity? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, first I want to address that you know, the way that we look at things, um, some of these conditions in a medical model is by looking at it as something that needs to be fixed, cured, improved, right? Yeah. Um, And the neurodiversity, you know, the neurodiversity, the the social justice model, and more, I would say, the social model of neurodiversity is really looking at these conditions as not something that we need to fix or change in society, but it's saying more that we are disabled because of the society around us, not accepting our unique qualities and characteristics. I love that you start that way Mm -hmm. because that that whole awkwardness I was discussing is like, we do need to learn to accept God made them that way. They're wired that way. And the more you get to know them, that's, that, that, that's the barrier. You need to know them if we're uncomfortable with ourselves, honestly. Mm-hmm. But once you get to know the people behind what makes you feel uncomfortable, you find out there's gold, there's beauty, there's yeah. genius. But the first glance makes you run the other way, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. I mean, even with the terms, right? Autism spectrum disorder, bipolar syndrome, uh, you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, yes. right? Those words are built in. But these labels are good for what they are, which is, you know, differentiating between these different conditions so that doctors have labels for these, you know, different conditions. But beyond that, you know, we need to, as you said, understand individuals on a more holistic level. Yeah. And for that reason, the label is not that important, right? If you put this lens of including people for their abilities and accepting them for their differences, then you're no longer, you know, hi, I'm Kushbu, I have ADHD. Instead, I'm saying, hi, I'm Kushbu and... I'm creative and innovative and imaginative and, you know, really delightful to be around. <laughs> well, and that's the interesting thing is that you discovered somewhere along your personal life journey, mm -hmm. you had ADHD. Now, correct. you coach, you speak on this, you deal with it. Mm -hmm. How did that transform you when you realize hey, I'm one of them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting because... I thought that I was just burnt out and depressed and I ended up in a therapist office. Um, and I just happened to have a therapist who was very observant and noticed that the things that I was upset about and the issues that I was having with my work and the kinds of things that I was having difficulty with, you know, in terms of my life, were all related to executive functioning issues. Um, and I'll explain this. Yeah. So executive functioning is how we get things done. And it has a lot to do with our behavior regulation. It has to do a lot with our emotional regulation. and has a lot to do with our cognitive regulation. And obviously that shows up in different ways. Um, specifically for me, you know, in my workplace, when I got a performance evaluation, I was being told that I had great relationships with my clients. They loved that I was participating in all these committees. They loved that I had, you know, joined this parent training program. However, you're not meeting your deadlines or, you need to build more hours and things like that. And so I was struggling with the basic things um, that happen that you're responsible for as you move up in your career, such as dealing with spreadsheets and yeah. <laughs> giving people feedback. So how did you respond to that? When they turned the table and reflected that, you're good, good, good. However, how did you first respond? Because some people just are like, you're killing me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I was very defensive. And, you know, to be honest, now looking back, I can recognize the empathy and understanding that my manager was bringing into that conversation still because she was also responsible for showing certain metrics to her manager yeah. um, and so on and so forth. But I didn't know what to do because, you know, when I got my diagnosis, I turned around and told my manager, I have ADHD and she didn't know how to help me and I didn't know what I needed help with. So and that it just was back when this was foreign territory. This is back when people, the, the term may have not even been out there. It may not have been really understood. But I, I can remember those days when people were like, well, they gave me a pill for ADHD and they gave me a pill or they didn't even give them a pill. They said, you got something. We don't know what it yeah. is. Yeah. And, I, and it was horrible. You, yeah. And the thing is, it wasn't even so much that she didn't know the term. It's that ADHD is so fast and it can show up in so many different ways that as a manager, she didn't know what I needed help with. And that's the thing. That's the thing with these labels is like, it's great that you have a label and you can answer certain questions about yourself that maybe you always wondered about, you know, why you struggled with X, Y, Z, right? But it didn't translate for me knowing what I needed to advocate for or which areas I needed support with. I couldn't articulate it. And well, so <laughs> you don't even know the question to ask. This is just you. This is yeah. what I, I, I had a very dear friend go through that and he was kind of like, 
I don't think they know what I'm really doing. I, I don't think they understand my head and my brain. I got all this stuff going on. I have so much. I'm, I'm having a blast. I'm not getting anything done. But I'm yeah. loving all it. It's like they're firing on all cylinders, right. but they're not getting anywhere. And then they finally begin to understand and finally begin to understand mm -hmm. what they're telling them. But it was a journey of all this is just noise. Right. And they finally got to where they could help them. And now he's he's like, oh, my goodness, if I could have done this 20 years ago, it'd be much better. <laughs> is that Absolutely. how it goes people through this? I mean, sort of, you know, there were a lot of things that I was sort of teased about when I was younger, like I was really clumsy, or I always had bruises on myself, I was always tripping on things, and I was dropping things and forgetting things and losing things, you know, and those are all ADHD things. But I was putting so much guilt and shame on myself growing up for those struggles. And I realize now it's just my brain. And I just need to have some strategies to work around these things. And there are things that I can improve on. And there are things that I can get help for. And there are things that I need supports with. And, so, you know, so was was that kind of liberating? Was, was there a freedom absolutely. in learning? It's okay to say, hi, I need a little help over here? Yeah, absolutely. But here's the thing about asking for help. You know, if the person sitting across from you is willing to help you, then that's great. <laughs> Um, if they know how to help you, that's even better. And I just kind of got myself in a situation where I kept struggling from one workplace to the next, to the next, to the next. And I kind of just got this really, you know, I had a chance to work for a lot of different companies. Yeah. But I also was not really still understanding myself as a neurodivergent person. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really sort of getting any help or advice around really sort of navigating different kinds of situations because earlier in my career, when I was a therapist, I went from client to client to client to client, solving novel problems on the fly, daily, playing with children all day long. Mm -hmm. It was great. I was doing really well with that. Yeah. Um, but when I became a clinician and I moved up in my career, all of a sudden my work responsibilities just made my work really different. And nobody tells you that, hey, the more successful you get, you know, the less time you spend with people, the more time you spend with spreadsheets. And exactly. And that's just, a game changer for a lot of people. Yeah. And I just fell apart. I felt like I wasn't getting anything right. I felt like feedback was being given to me and I still couldn't. I didn't know what I didn't know what I needed. So I was really struggling for a long time. Well, you're, you're, you're now an advocate. You're speaking on this. You have an amazing team, which we are going to talk about in here in a little bit. Yeah. But what can organizations, what can schools create or do to help make this space better, safer, more understandable? What, what can organizations and schools do? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is the kinds of things we look for when we are working with someone, interacting with someone, teaching someone. You know, we have a really strict rubric of how we expect people to be, you know. Um, in my current workplace, my actual manager handles some of the things that are challenging for me so that my actual strengths can shine. I love and that's that. The difference. <laughs> and that's the difference. They're helping you know? stay in your sweet spot and they're helping balance the awkward things that just... Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen in every work environment. No. A lot, a lot of times it's, it's your job, it's your role. I got something else to do. And you just go do your darn thing. Right. What a great way to balance <laughs> it out to help you succeed and help them succeed. Absolutely. I think, you know, we just need to have a little bit more compassion and a little bit more curiosity. Because most times when people are doing something that we don't expect or that's something that's weird to us or different to us, most of the time, they're not doing it intentionally. No. We have to keep that in mind because we're so quick to assume, right? Yes. That when someone hasn't completed something that they are trying to get out of work. Yes. Or if someone's forgotten something, they don't care about us, right? We're so quick to jump to these conclusions. Well, or you go the other direction. 
Correct. And I've got a family member who dealt with, they were so smart, so bright. They blew mm-hmm. through all the work in class and there's mm-hmm. still 45 minutes left to go. Right. And then they began being disruptive because they couldn't be quiet. Right. <laughs> and it goes the other way where high achievers have that same type of issue with, what do I do with myself now? And yeah. it becomes, oh, you're being a, an idiot. You're being, you're, you're being a jerk. You're misbehaving again. <laughs> when in fact, they're asking the wrong question. They don't understand. They actually need more work. They need Correct. extra assignments. You yeah. have to learn that, don't you? Absolutely. And a lot of neurodivergent children have disruptive classroom behaviors for these reasons. They are not getting enough, you know, basically mm-hmm. enough socialization or enough activities to do. Um, a lot of times when I worked in classrooms, I would have the teacher create basically a pile of extra worksheets yes. for students with ADHD that need something to do um, or need to move their body or need to do yeah. whatever it is that they need to do so that they can remain focused and they can remain engaged. And all of us have these things, right? So we I have don't... this, uh, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was, I was just going to mention, I, I remember the transition point mm-hmm. when doing a lot of speaking and traveling and people start putting squishy balls and rolly pins yes. and colored crayons on the yes. table for an executive meeting. Right. Um, <laughs> concentrate up here, up here. And I began to hear and understand they need the tactile. They mm-hmm. need to do something while they're, they're listening. They're taking notes. They're in tune with you, but they need that squishy ball to keep them sane. Absolutely. So this is actually called stimming um, or self-stimulatory behavior, but it is essentially our body's need to do something in order to deal with the external stimuli of the world around us. That's a prime example of what I was saying earlier. We just, they need to have that to stay with you here. Correct. And most of us are like, hold your hand, <laughs> sit still and just watch. And yeah, it's not all of us do can that. do that. Not yeah. all of us can do that. And children especially, you know, let's think about what do we expect children to be able to do in preschool? Okay, we expect them to sit. We expect them to follow directions. We expect them to know this all the songs of circle time. Mm-hmm. We expect them. We expect them to imitate. You know. Yes. How are we expecting people to do all that when they're so little? Right. Well, it takes so much self control as adults. Don't you think? Johnny, Johnny, raise your hand, please. Raise your hand. But Johnny's out of his chair, walking up to the chalkboard already. <laughs> Correct. Correct. And, and you know, that, that sort of applies to all the different arenas of life, right? Yes. A lot of the work that we do is in employment. And let's think about, you know, what an entry level position is today. Do we even know? Because how are we expecting new grads to have a bachelor's degree, to have years of work experience? And then we say, you know, we want you to be able to stand on a, you know, a surfboard with one foot while juggling balls of fire. Yes. And if you can do that, maybe we'll consider you for this position. Exactly. And we're just making it really, really hard. We're making it hard for people to be human when we do these things. When I go back to the beginning of the show, I was talking about this may be a term you're not familiar with. Is neurodivergency becoming more familiar of a term, a concept? Where are we at with the real growth of understanding what you're trying to help us understand? You know, I think we're still pretty in the beginning stages of that. I do think there's more people talking about it than they're used to maybe two years ago, five years ago, even 10 years ago. But I think that it's constantly changing because as we, you know, become a more diverse society, you know, more people are getting diagnosed with autism. We still don't know what's causing autism. Yeah. More people are getting diagnosed with ADHD. Um, in fact, with ADHD, the higher trend is of grown adults basically saying, I think I need to get an ADHD diagnosis because I wasn't diagnosed as a kid. Bingo. Right. 
And that's happening a lot more, you know, as our knowledge expands, as we have more awareness about these different neurodivergent conditions, more and more and more people are becoming diagnosed. And at this point, you know, they're saying about one in four people are neurodivergent. So one in four. Mm -hmm. Wow. As far as one in four. So, so the latest statistic from CDC is one in 36. Wow. But people say that, and that's just for autism. That doesn't include ADHD, dyslexia, bipolar, none of those things. So we don't have a lot of really good statistics on ADHD and dyslexia as much as we do with autism because there's just been more funding in autism research. But let's think about that. That's, you know, one in every three people, one in every four people that are in our classrooms, that are in our schools, that are in our community, that are in our homes, right? Yes. Yeah. And how can we as a society work together to make sure that those people are included intentionally? Well, that is the question. Well, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a second. I want to really poke <laughs> that bear a little bit harder. But I speak on stuttering because I live with a stutter. Mm -hmm. And one out of 100 people have a stutter. There's right. 80 million people globally. The right. stat you just said is more than double than stutters. And I think the stuttering stat is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. One out of 100. So when I'm speaking in an arena, yeah, there's several people out there. But you're talking about double the rate mm -hmm. and the impact. Because I remember the study, yeah. the labeling, the question about Smart, dumb, idiot, what is he? You're mm -hmm. talking about double the rate of people struggling with this. So how yeah. are people helping? How are I people mean, getting this? <laughs> I think, you know, we're all struggling. There's, there's a lack of, you know, service providers that are able to work with these people. And I think schools struggle because most teachers don't have to learn special education. You know, if you're an English teacher, you may not know anything about special education, but you may have a person in your classroom who is autistic. You may have a person in your classroom who's dyslexic. And if you're an English teacher, expecting people to read books and write essays, that dyslexic student is going to struggle if they don't have the right supports. So you just touched on a point of the special education, that they're not special mm -hmm. education used to be they got put in a different room and they got dealt with somebody else. More and more, it all becoming mainstream. We're being blended together. Yeah. The walls have come down with that. But if they're not Somewhere. trained in it, mm -hmm. how do you, with your organization, when you go in and you speak, you train, you coach, how do, how do you and others like you get in there to help them improve this? I mean, it's rough, you know. So when um, – this is actually from my previous career when I was a clinician – I worked for a school district and I was sent out to different classrooms where teachers needed support. And what I would do is I would observe the environment. I would observe the student. I would look at what they're struggling with and I would create some strategies and tools for the teacher to use in her classroom in order to be able to, you know, basically manage all the responsibilities but I think this is a larger question that we need to ask yeah. is how much can teachers really be responsible for? Yes. You know, as a society, if we are, if we have this idea that people who are disabled, you know, aren't a part of our society or they should be shunned away, you know, we've moved past that, but it also needs to change in how we think about it. You know, we are very ableist sometimes in how we think about designing things. And it's important for us to question, you know, is this space accessible to everyone? Is this document accessible to everyone? Is this website or app accessible to everyone? Yes. And we're asking those questions now, you know. Sure. we There's a lot of work to be done in these areas. I think there's a lot of, I think, awareness that needs to be built in our mm -hmm. culture around accepting people for who they are and, and meeting them where they are and working with them rather than just expecting that everyone's going to follow these rules and be the specific type of person, you know? So this is the other part of the struggle. The, the other part of the equation is mom and dad home life because 
they're yeah. struggling. Usually they're swimming in the deep end by themselves looking for any help because yeah. the schools have some structure. They may have some things that support, but then you have mom and dad and it's like they go to school, they come home and it's mm -hmm. totally disruptive. How can we build bridge that gap between schools, parents, special programs and make it all work more symbiotic together? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to be done. I think, you know, schools can do a better job of collaborating with parents and thinking through solutions. Um, in terms of supports outside of school, you know, there are a lot of services available for people who have neurodivergent children or children who have neurodivergent conditions that they need supports with. But unfortunately, you know, some of those services are hard to get by depending on where you are in the country. So here in California, you know, there's a lot of different companies providing services, but there's not that many service providers. So there's always wait lists to get onto services. There's wait lists to find things that you need. And I think, you know, we need to have more of a push. We need to have more policy around this. You know, we need to have our governments, you know, put a spotlight and a focus on this thing that's a very much a part of our lives and it's going to continue to be there. How are we as a society going to become more accepting and more inclusive in a way that doesn't look at someone like they need to fit into some kind of a really specific rubric of life. Right. You don't need to fix them, change them. We need yes. to better understand and work with so right. everyone can work together. So, Education, school, back, mm -hmm. again, this is going way back, but this is what I remember when my kids went to school. You know, yeah. you, you had the eye test, the hearing test. You had mm -hmm. those other things. You had to go through certain protocols. So they had some right. idea coming into from your home to 80 other kids. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything like that to help that be found for ADH or other things? Is that becoming part of that entry process now? Yes and no. Um, you know, you can find a lot of different self-assessments online, but to get a diagnosis is a lengthy process. It's an expensive process. It's a timely process. It's a subjective process. <laughs> There's a lot of issues with it. You know, the first autism assessments that were created were created by only studying eight-year-old white middle-class boys. Um, so we don't really have a lot of measures that are looking at how these things show up in adults or women or people with other backgrounds, yeah. um, people from different cultures. You know, there's a, a lot more research that needs to be done. But I would say that, you know, as a society, we can do a lot of different things to fix these issues. But the main thing is just our mindset around how we think about it. Right. And that's really what it comes down to. Right. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, how it's so easy to look at something and say, well, you know, that's rude. Right. Let's say that's rude, for example. Yeah. You notice something and you think, huh, that person's rude. Yeah. But, you know, you have just what you can see on the outside, you know, yeah. maybe if you talk to that person, you find out they're taking care of an aging parent outside of work. Maybe you find out that they are grieving from a death of a loved one. Mm -hmm. Right. And all of us, whether or not we're neurodivergent or neurotypical, every single one of us has the ability to have these different things about neurodiversity impacted, right? Yeah. The way we work can be impacted. Our ability to focus can be impacted. And if we just decided, you know what, let's just work with people and understand where they're coming from and ask them why. And that's part of that safety you were talking about. Mm -hmm. We have to create a more safety way of saying, it's okay to ask me a question. Yeah. It's, it's okay to help me throttle down and calm down. It's right. okay. It's not demeaning. It's not throwing yeah. you out. We've got to create a better way that there's a safety of comfort that 
you love me, you respect me, you understand me, and that's why you're doing and asking or saying these things. Correct. I, Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's so empowering to be asked, right? Many of us just walk around with our assumptions and go along our merry day. Um, but, you know, the people who actually take a moment to be with the person, to be present with them, to pay attention to what they are maybe not even saying, you know? Yeah. It could be something as small as just having a pause, having some silence so that the other person even feels that they can speak up. You know, one um, neurodivergent characteristic is we don't know when to interject in conversations. Turn-taking can be hard for us, right? Ah. And so if, for example, your manager, you could, in the team meeting, solicit a response from that person and say, hey, you know, Rich, I haven't heard from you in a minute. Why don't you share what you think about this? Intentionally engage and bring them in. Mm -hmm. This I is to empower love. everyone. No, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that, 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 that's beautiful. Now, I do know you guys have an online career launch program for neurodivergence. Mm -hmm. It helps job seekers, right, to navigate some of this. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about that program, if you will, because I'm sure many people yes. have no idea there's resources <laughs> out there like that. Absolutely. So we actually run this two times a year. So we have a spring cohort and a fall cohort. And it's a 17-week learn-by-doing online course. It's fully on Zoom. So um, whether you are in Minnesota, whether you're in California or New York or D.C., you would be able to attend our program fully on Zoom. And, you know, this is for people who are underemployed or unemployed. And underemployed is anyone who's doing a job that's not relevant to their interests, mm. their strengths, their skills, and their qualifications. Meaning, if you're working as a delivery person or working in a grocery store when you have a bachelor's degree, technically you're underemployed, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we want to work with people who have a two- or four-year college degree or equivalent. The equivalent is their for people who've done a boot camp or who've done certifications, anyone that has basically skills in order to be able to get a job. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of neurodivergent people, you know, people with autism, people with ADHD, grew up facing a lot of exclusion or bullying or yes. just feeling othered, right? Mm -hmm. So we recognize that these people are coming into our program with a lot of trauma, Yes. So the goal of our program is to give them a sense of agency that they can go after their goals. They can dream to get the kind of job that really aligns with what they want to do. Um, and we want them to feel self-determined that they can walk into a workplace and say, this is what I need to focus. And this is how I work best. And I would love it if you could call on me during meetings. <laughs> and, you know, just those simple things that can that can make or break your experience in a workplace. Well, being able to declare that with confidence and reveal it versus hide it. Mm -hmm. And to be able to just say, here it is, here's how it is, and here's what's going to help me out to help yes. you out. Right. Um, I'm going to bring up, you have an amazing book, and I think people yes. really need, because... Hey, I love the title. Yay. Neurodiversity for dummies. Because, <laughs> hey, I was a dummy uh, and I've done my research, but you're trying to put tools in people's hands to help them mm -hmm. understand and break the barriers. Tell me about the book. Right. If people hit the QR code and scan and learn more about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, this book is literally for everyone. You know, if you're a parent, if you are a neurodivergent person, um, if you have a company and you have employees, if you're an educator, you could be anyone in society. If you if you know someone who's neurodivergent, this book can help you understand how to empower them, how to accept them, how to learn about them, how to support them, and how to make it so that you create more psychological safety wherever you go, 
because, you know, we like to say that neurodiversity is sort of like the mother of all diversity inclusion because it cuts through all other identities. You know, neurodiversity doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. It shows up in every race. It shows up in every sexual orientation. It shows up at every age. It shows up, you know, with all the genders, right? So what we're saying with neurodiversity is if we can accept that all of us in this world are uniquely designed in how our brain works, then we can absolutely learn to work each work with each other and collaborate with each other in ways where we can feel accepted, no matter how differently we do things. Because this is actually a human a natural human variation, right? Oh, I like that. It's a natural mm-hmm. human variation. Correct. And that just makes it so much easier to accept <laughs> it. This is how it is, folks. It's okay. Relax. Take a breath. Yeah. I mean, and if you think about it, right, like, you know, the, you know, the little bell graph that we see mm-hmm. in statistics, right? Yep. When we look at that standard deviation, And if I were to ask you the question, which part of this bell curve is normal, what would you say? Well, usually they're talking about the high bubble, the high peak of everything. But usually I'm like out on the wing someplace. I I think that's kind of the real normal. This may be the peak, but you're not the bottom, but you're out on the wings. (laughs) Actually, it's actually the whole bell curve. Okay. Every part of it is the normal C because if you look at it right the reason why that diversity exists is because of how different and unique and interesting and flavorful we all are as human beings because that is what makes it basically diversity right so we're looking at all of us and saying there's nothing wrong with neurodiversity neurodiversity is normal it's a normal part of human diversity I love that. Brains that think differently and speak differently and process information differently. That's a part of human diversity, right? Kushpo, this has been fabulous. Amazing. Again, that last illustration. Again, <laughs> we're learning something new every time, every time. Kushpo, where's the best place for people to find you, to connect with you, to learn more about what you're doing? Absolutely. I would say definitely on our website at ndpathways.org. Um, On there, you know, if you are someone who's interested in our programs or attending our career readiness training, you can find all the information about that. If you're an organization, if you're a startup, if you're an educational institution, if you're a team leader, if you're any kind of leader and you want to get more training, more understanding on this topic, You can learn more about our awareness sessions and our workshops. And of course, you can go on to Amazon. And you can search for Neurodiversity for Dummies to learn more about neurodiversity. Um, This book is something that we have poured our entire hearts into. Um, A lot of people feel really offended by the Dummies brand because they think the word Dummies is ableist. However, we like to think of it more as coming from a learner's mindset, a beginner's mindset. Yep. And this book is very accessible. It's written in plain English, very easy terminology, so that anyone who picks it up from, regardless of which, you know, background you come from, it would be a great way for you to learn more about neurodiversity, so that not only you can empower the neurodivergent people around you, but you can just also show up with more compassion and more curiosity in the spaces that you occupy. Good Shpo, thank you very much. This has been an excellent, I've learned a lot. I know our people have learned a lot. And uh, best of luck with the book and everything else you're doing. But thank you for pioneering and leading and getting out there in front of us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. Kushpo Chambra. And again, we will have all this information in the show notes. It will be down below as you watch this, replay it, share it. And again, we're streaming every week live on Sunday nights here. You get to watch the premiere parties. We're on YouTube. We are on PPN, the Public Place Network. On the Public Place Network, we are streaming in 17 different countries around the world and expanding. And on YouTube, of course, you get the live chat. You get to add your comments, add in your questions. And it's a fun time 
7 o'clock Sunday nights. We're back here every week with a new exciting show. Follow us, like us, share us, join the conversation, join the community, and come back every Sunday night for another edition of Rock the State Show. That's going to do it for tonight. We'll see you back here next Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. 